Well, thank you so much for coming. Let's start. Tell us where you grew up. Uh, tell us about Munich, this amazing city, right? Or is it not? <laughs> In the reverse sense. Right. I mean, it, uh, I think it's a lot better now than it used to be, but I think Germany in general has been for a really long time a relatively grim place. Um, you, you, you can raise money there, but um, when I tried to do that first in 99, um, y you had to do a lot of things that I think uh, me and my friends didn't have. We, we wore sneakers and you needed suits and ties and you needed a great McKinsey background and we dropped out of college, which is like unheard of in Germany. What did you, what did you, what did you want to be? Like what, what did your parents do for work? Did you have these dreams of being an entrepreneur or did you have dreams of doing something else? What did you want to do? I wanted to be a director all my life. A director? Yeah, a movie director. Oh, a movie director, okay. Yes. I thought you meant like a director in a company. Yeah, like, I wanted no, to be middle management. I, I wanted to be in middle management <laughs> at Wells Fargo. Um, was a desk. Gosh, me too. Yes. We're so like... It was a great dream. No, I wanted to be a movie director for as long as I can remember. Oh, that's cool. Um, I think that was literally the first thing that I told my parents that I love to do. I, I don't know why that is. I, I, I know two things. I love to... I had a, I had a movie camera and I love to do slow motion videos with Legos, w way before the Lego movie. We're, we're talking about when I was like 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And I think I always um, love telling people what to do. So maybe a, a director <laughs> does that to a certain degree as well. So maybe that's why that, yeah. And so, um, so, so tell us just quickly about your career path. You kind of bounced around in different companies. You started it, well you started a company, you dropped out of college, you started yes. this company. Let's start there. What, what was the company? Give us the 10 second pitch yep. and tell us, you raised a little bit of money from friends and family and yep. tell us what happened. The company was called Seven a Day um, and, and just imagine a marketplace that has a, a curious, curated list, seven products a day, that the name kind of gives that away, um, available, but the amount of them in stock is very limited and rather than telling you how, mu how many of the items are in stock, there is a bar that indicates that other people are buying these products and the price drops constantly throughout the day. So at some point, uh, you see the savings and you see that there is not many uh, items left in stock. And we were betting on the fact that you're super antsy to purchase that product, Ex except nobody really did that. Um, that was in 99, so uh, to our defense, not many people bought anything but books online. And we had lots of electronics and other stuff and even less people purchased something uh, in Europe or in Germany. So we had the company for around a year and we bootstrapped it, yeah. And, and then what happened? You just you shut it down or you did you guys just move on to other things or what, what happened with your, your team members? And well, we spent all our parents' money at that time. Um, so uh, we, had, we had to shut it down and when we decided to get jobs and maybe earn a little bit ourselves. Did, how did they feel about that? Was that a, were, were they expecting? I mean, you're never, you're never hoping to lose your money when you invest something, but was, was the expectation going in like, hey, you're probably going to lose your money or was it like, did you sell them the dream and then it came kind of crashing down? I think my parents have a relatively thick skin when it comes to losing money, um, it, the, it, things that have to do with me. I, the, the, first, the first bill that we had, uh, the internet, an internet bill or a telephone bill, I think was at that time around 5,000 Deutschmarks because uh, I lured my parents into believing that it wouldn't be that expensive and I spent nights and days and you, know, you had to buy these excess codes and it was pre-AOL. So that was the first thing. Then I think they lost a ton of money um, because of me in the stock market because at that time I convinced them to buy Apple stock, which then went nowhere for, for, for some time. So that was another 10,000. So they, they were used to the fact of losing money with my crap. <laughs> Have you paid him back yet? Or? Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, now did. I did. Okay, good. I was very proud. Yeah. How long did that take? Just, I think, a month ago or so. <laughs> you paid him back a month ago? Yeah. So that's I'm 38 awesome. now, so they have to wait 20 <laughs> years, but <laughs> that's, that's really better cool. than never. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's way better than never. It's like a, it's like a, it's like, a <laughs> like a student loan, except, you know, I dropped out, so. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, uh, they must be very proud now, I'm sure. Uh, so t tell, tell, me, tell me how you met your co-founders. How did, how did you meet Sean and how did you meet Sam? This is fast forwarding almost 10 years from yes. there, but how did, how did you meet these two guys? Well, I, Sam was a friend of mine in London. Um, I, moved from, I moved from living in Germany, in Munich and in Berlin. Um, I moved to the UK, to London. I worked for PA Consulting. It's a consulting firm. They, they, I don't even remember in details anymore what I did there because it's, it's really boring, mind-numbing stuff. They're doing lots of government work and 
um, but they pay you very well. So um, you know you get a um, you get a huge salary and you get a you get a great bonus. So that can calm you down for for some. And you time. were a director, so it was no. I I, I think I they had an innovations arm called IPAX, yeah. and I worked in that team there on on product development. And that's when I met Sam. Okay. Um, and we met Sean over here in the, U, in the U.S. Um, because both of the companies that we were working on at that time were part of the first AngelPad batch. Our company was called Curated By. And the company of Sean, our third co-founder, was called Hug Energy. Okay. And, and how did, uh, what, what happened with Curated By? How did, how did that kind of evolve into Postmates? So Curated By was, well, I think, was just a really... The other thing that I knew um, for almost as long as I can remember is that at some point I would love to have a company in the United States in the Valley. So even when I was 14, 15 years old, um, you know, I had that being a director dream. And I think relatively shortly after that, the other thing that would interest me was to run a startup uh, in, 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 in Silicon Valley. And I read so much about it, and of course, you read the newspapers, and you read the things, and you're inspired by the companies. And in my case, it took a bit longer to get here, but it had always been my dream. So, um, was the company curated by, we just met Thomas Corte, who was uh, one of the guys who runs AngelPad, and he's German. And even though the idea was incredibly stupid, he said, you know, I I'm sure you guys figure out eventually what you want to do, but if you guys come to the States, I'm going to introduce you to the network that I have. And that was an opportunity that, that I just couldn't resist, um, given the fact that for the last 15 plus years, I had, I had you know, wanted that to was be like here. a huge dream. Yeah. yeah. And so what happened? You got here, you, you go into the. Well, incubator. we got here, we pretty much figured out that the idea is completely stupid and um, that it's not something that we want to spend the rest of our, the rest of our lives on. Um, uh, we also had a really hard time raising money. Um, you talked about Naval earlier. I, I, I give you a quick story about Naval, how I met him. Uh, we pitched him as an angel investor. Um, it's actually a, a great story that uh, probably shows a little bit of resilience and how important it is to like, keep in touch with people. So we, we, we pitched him and he said, you know, you seem like a cool guy, but that's never going to work. And, uh, uh, you so pitched him curated by. We pitched him curated by. Yeah. And, and, and really to just think about curated by, think about it, it's a curation tool that allows you to put content, predominantly tweets, into bundles that you're an expert of and share that with other people. So there's all that stuff out there and we thought it would be great if, to give you better tools to curate that information. And so we pitched him on that um, and, and, and he didn't want any of that, but he said, you know, I, I'm doing kind of a startup myself, AngelList, he, he just started doing that. And he said, why don't you guys join me as venture hackers and you're going to get a million in equity each and uh, you and Sam, you, you, you know, we could really do something cool together. We thought about this for the day and then we declined and we said, you know, this is awesome. Like for you to join the AngelList team? Yeah, yeah. yeah so okay. he, he basically oh, turned cool. a VC pitch into a recruiting pitch on his side. Yeah. He's good at that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if many of you know Naval, you all should know him. I think he's a little bit more difficult to get hold of these days than 2010 or 2011. But um, he's a great guy if you have a chance to talk to him. So he tries to turn this conversation into a recruiting pitch and we decline. Uh, but I asked him one question in that recruiting pitch and that is what happened, I asked him what would happen to the money that we has raised, so the money from Thomas. And that, that impressed him because um, if you guys read about what Naval did in the past, he, he had his rough patches too with investors in the Valley and, um, he got and thrown out of his company, he got thrown out of his company. So he, he was impressed that we would, that we would be concerned about not burning any bridges with the investors into Postmates and he said, uh, into Curated Buy, and he said, you know, we would take care of them, but we still declined the offer. Um, but fast forward, uh, six, six months later, it was only six months when we started working on Postmates. He was the first person that we pitched, and he had just invested in Uber, I think, three or four months earlier. And we walked in the office, and it was the three of us, so he knew us from AngelPad, and we had um, just a working prototype. And literally all we showed him is like that we could enter something on this iPhone, and the other iPhone, the Postmates Courier iPhone, uh, would beep, and you would see these two people moving on the map. And he, he wrote a check over $250,000 in that meeting, um, and, and he led our seat round. Wow. 
I just thought that's a great story. To that share. is a great story. Yeah, that's never happened in any of my meetings with him. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of upset about it now. Um, what, 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 where did this idea come from? Where, where did Postmates, where, where did, you you do curated by, okay, it doesn't work. Then where does Postmates come from? What's the genesis of the idea? So I have this ledger of ideas. Just yeah. like, I, I'm sure you guys all have that. And some of them just keep haunting you. And Postmates was one of these ideas that just kept haunting me. Um, I had the idea just when I moved to London. Uh, I moved from Munich to London. And believe it or not, I had this, you know, a U-Haul coming by and they, we loaded it and drove all the stuff to my parents' place because, you know, you don't really want to take it all in, in a new city in another country with you at first. And they forgot to take my snowboard. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a week out. There's basically nothing in my house. I'm staying at a friend's place and there's the snowboard still there. So I'm trying to figure out how I can get my snowboard to my parents' place. Um, UPS FedEx cost a fortune in Germany. Uh, the item is considered freight. Uh, they want you to wrap it. Uh, the whole thing was just horrible. So I started calling local courier companies. And they, they just gave, us, or gave me weird quotes. Uh, some would tell me that they could do it in two months because they had a trip planned. My, my parents live outside Berlin. It's 500 miles. Or some, that, some said they could do it tonight. <laughs> it charged 400 euros. So it was just a wild world out there. But what would happen is that two days later, a friend called me and he said, you know what, I'm driving up to Berlin. You just want me to drop this off at your mom's place. Now, Germany is, is very different um, uh, geography-wise than the United States. You have 80, 84 million people. You have a lot of cities with a million plus people in relatively close proximity. People travel a lot on the weekend, students that... Uh, study in Frankfurt, drive back to Munich, or drive to Cologne, people from Hamburg visit Berlin. So you have a lot more traveling throughout the country than you have it in the U.S. And ride-sharing had already been a huge thing. People leverage ride-sharing very differently because of that infrastructure of people traveling. So the original idea of Postmates, the, the very, very first one was just, what if you could like create a friendlier version than like the postal service, like where your friends carry the stuff for you because they already travel to a destination anyway? Was this the only time that, that you experienced this? I mean, that's kind of a, it's kind of a rare use case, right? Like where you forget something totally different than like, I'm hungry every single day yeah. and I'm too lazy to go, you know, or I don't have the time to go. I mean, that happens all the time, right? Yeah. So, I mean, did, did you, like, did you think, wow, this, this could be this huge thing? Or was it like, hey, I'm just going to solve this problem? And I mean, did you? this market could be that early on or was it was it you know did you think you were going to use it every single day or do you think hey i might use it once a month or what 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 did you think people how did you think people would use it well i think here's an interesting thing that that probably happens very often when you when you have an idea and that that is probably that you that you're so euphoric about the idea and that you are so excited about what you have discovered that at least for myself i'm often uh, when, the, when the idea is just, it's just very fragile and it's, it's still very young, you get, you get so excited about everything surrounding it that I think you can over-project the, the frequency of use of these things. And I remember that definitely back at the time we were like, oh my God, if, if, if it's that easy, people will clearly do it more often just because it's that easy. And I think uh, that's actually one of, one of the dangers of when you, when you start with an idea of getting married to a specific thing too early. I mean, for Postmates, it's it took then four years and it took a couple of iterations for us to figure out that that's actually not the use case that would ever grow that company fast. We, at some point, we figured out it's prepared food. And, and by four or five years, I mean, like, I obviously didn't work on the idea for a long time. But even when we got back to the idea, we, we started to look at it from an angle of, like, delivering things within your city. But we still hadn't figured out the idea, like, what is the trigger... What's the most frequent inventory in a city that you can use every day? And, and it turned out that that would be prepared food, but customers did guide us. We, 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 it, it was none of us just waking up one day and saying, like, it's a no-brainer, we do prepared food. And sometimes th that is probably because how you think about the product, you think about it in, like, its ultimate form. And I think that's totally what Postmates will be that then if you need to do something like the stuff I had to do with my snowboard, it's available. But in order to get there, you're probably, I think the, the, the way to get there is what we missed at the beginning. So w when you launched, how, how did you launch originally? Did you have your own drivers and riders? Did you, 
Did you use other existing infrastructure? What did you do? At the very beginning, we signed up every, any, every existing messenger company in San Francisco. We signed up on the platform. There, there's around 25 or 30 of them, mm. and I would run around, and we would pitch them uh, one by one, and we would give them iPhones, and we would tell them, like, look, uh, you know, you don't have much to do. So uh, he, 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 here's a great way uh, because we will have a lot of things to do for you. So be part of this. And did it work? No. Did, didn't work. Why not? Well, they were all excited about it, but, you know, I, I think the, the, the messenger industry in general is like, is like an industry that has been, um, they have been really like, they have been like pushed almost on like the, like the outskirts of society. They're like the renegades, right? I mean, they, there was a time when it, when it was a glorious thing and when, when everybody needed messengers and in cities like New York and San Francisco, they were big and thriving and, and, and then, you know, PDF came along and a lot of other things happened. So being a messenger kind of pushed you more and more into like uh, one of jobs, uh, not very regular customer relationships, uh, very comparable products. Um, and, and, and so they, 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 that whole community became a little bitter and it became a little um, guarded. And, and, and I think that's what we felt when we started working with them. It, it becomes more of a lifestyle than it, than it really becomes a business. And, and you were talking about your customers kind of guiding you. Um, I, I read about a story where basically you, uh, your customers started writing in the notes in the app yep. and saying, hey, we don't want, I don't want you to bring me this furniture, but I'd, I'd, I would like you to bring me some food or I would like you to bring me this or that. T tell us about that, how that evolution happened and then the shift that you made in the company. It's actually an upsetting story because we, the first version of Postmates that we created was a beautiful product. It, it looked like a notepad and it was designed for local merchants. We, we had talked to hundreds of merchants in San Francisco and we had determined that the biggest pain point for them is that somebody comes in the store, wants to buy a product, and they can't deliver it. So we've designed an app that would do that for them. Um, it's an app that they could install or they, we would even give them in some cases an, uh, an iPod or whatever to run it on. And two taps, you enter the pickup, pre-default it's your store, you enter a drop-off, and we signed up every single furniture store in San Francisco <laughs> three or four years ago. And they were all so excited to use the app. Um, and and um, then we built the app for them and nothing happened. As in, th there wasn't many stores that actually used it. And if they used it, they used it every once in a while. So we started talking to them. We, we, long story short, what happened in de instead is that customers who would download the, ad, the app, they would as a pickup, enter a store or a restaurant, and in the description field, they would just type a shopping list, and they would send off that request to the network. And we had to cancel a lot of these orders simply because we didn't have any payment infrastructure in place. And, and, and this is why it's so, such an upsetting story, because we built this product for the wrong audience. We, we built it for the merchant when where we should have started is the customers. Because it turns out that everybody loves the idea that you can point your cell phone like a remote control at a store and you can type down what you want and you have these items delivered in a couple of minutes. Um, and, and we didn't see that at all. Uh, what we saw was the need from the merchant side. And so what changed? What shifted and, and when you changed the product, what happened? Oh, money. I mean, we, we did a test one weekend, and, and I think we sold $10,000 worth of merchandise on, on, the first, on the very first weekend. We sent out an email, and we said, you know what, guys? This weekend, if you use the hashtag get it now, and you enter the items that you want, we're going to get them to you. And we, uh, at that time, I think we had 25 or 30 Postmates. This is on years. Twitter or something, or what? What do you mean the hashtag? Like, oh, in, oh in, in the app. In the if app. You used in it the, in the we app. we yeah. needed a trigger um, to, to guide you to a Postmate who would have a payment method. And what we did as a payment method is we gave them uh, prepaid gift cards. So we, we, we bought tens of thousands of dollars worth. We, and by the way, I, everybody should try that once in his or her life, her or his <laughs> life. Go to a Safeway with a credit card and try to buy $10,000 worth of Visa $100 gift cards. It's the greatest experience in your life. <laughs> they called the cops twice and it, it, it's totally insane. And then try to explain your bank who's blocking the transaction why you're buying $10,000 worth of Visa gift cards. It's, it's totally cool. Um, and, and, and 
it's even better if you have to do that when you, when you run out of money and it's like 8 or 9 o'clock and you have to go to one of the dodgy safe ways because you basically You've sold out all the gift other ones. cards on all the other ones. And this <laughs> is a true story. It, we sold out almost the entire city of San Francisco. At some point, there were only $50 gift cards left. And we would distribute them to the fleet because at that time, we didn't have another payment method. But once we started this experiment, we had to obviously keep it going and people wanted it and wanted more and more and more of it. So... Um, we wrote some clever systems on, for couriers to keep a tally. Uh, we, Sean, my co-founder, invented a system that would auto-dial the 1-800 numbers on the back of a Visa gift card to check the balance so that we could have some sort of like, understanding on where we stand. Um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Where did you find these original writers? Where, where did they come from? So at some point, I think we just did um, two things. We did uh, ads at universities, at, 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 at college boards, and we did Craigslist ads. Okay. That was the very first batch Those were your first of dozens Postmates. of, of yeah. Postmates. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how did you, what, what did you learn from, from those very first ones, and how did that change over time in terms of who you recruited? Like, who is, your, who is the perfect Postmate for you guys? Oh, we probably didn't pay enough attention to the first. We sh probably should have, should have paid way more attention to the, f to the couple of first ones. I think the learnings on the supply side have been, uh, for the people who, who follow the company, I think we did not pay enough attention to the supply side until about 18 months, two years in. And there was a time when it was a lot of, ha it has been written that, uh, you know, it was impossible to get a postmate to accept the delivery. And I think, uh, un until we really hit some, some bigger traction, we probably didn't care about the supply side, understanding who they are from a monetary compensation. We, all, we always cared about them, but understanding who they are and what drives them, we probably neglected that side of the business for, I would say, 18 months. And what about now? Like, what, when you think of the Postmates, what, what is so great about your product that keeps them coming back? What, what do you, how do you think about them? What... How do you, how do you look, at, look at them? So we have this metrics internally, and the cool thing about it is after, after, after somebody did 10 deliveries, we know if that's going to be a power post made or a regular post made. Um, so one of the things that, we are, that we're trying to do is to understand the first 10 deliveries, they define the experience for Postmates on the Postmates platform. And we're trying to do a lot of design and understanding and measuring around those first 10 deliveries. Before that, um, it, it is a bunch of boring stuff um, uh, 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 that, that, that is probably not as exciting, and, and a lot of it has to do with a relatively deep source list. That means not just relying on one platform, but we have, I would say, 20, 30 channels uh, for the supply side acquisition um, rather than just relying on Craigslist ads. There's so many interesting things about this, uh, this, this company and about your story in particular. I think one of those is that, you know, we're talking about you guys starting this in 2011. And I, I can, I, I moved here in 2005, and I can remember 2011 very clearly. And every startup that I met at Startup Grind or wherever else was working on like a Groupon clone or, or, or an incubator. You know, it was like, there were these, you know, and you see it today, there are all these themes and it just kind of comes in. And, and now it's like, we're in 2015, it's four years later, and like on demand, is just the rage, right? Yeah. And and here you guys have been working on it for years and years and years, and it's like it's like you're this startup that is an overnight success, five years, four years in the making. And I, I wonder, like, what has that been like for you as somebody that's been toiling away, you know, just on this concept and figuring it out? And and as you see all these people coming in, like, how what what is, like how do you how, what is your perception and what are your thoughts on how hot this whole topic has become and, and all these people that have kind of jumped into the space. So we knew that this would be huge. I don't know why, and I don't mean Postmates, I mean this space. Um, I, I don't know why, but when, when we started the company in, in 2011, I think there were already a lot of signals that would point towards a world that works faster than 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 the current work, uh, than the current world, and and we I don't think we had an idea on how much impact uh, on demand space could have on commerce, but I think what we did at we looked at the status quo and we looked at how the world work, works and how it used to work, 
and I think a good indicator on how the future is going to be is that it probably doesn't look anything like the past. So, uh, you know, rather than believing that the space will be good, we also had really deep belief, belief in ourselves that this is something that we want to do. And I think sometimes that's more important than just riding a wave that you can already see, right? I mean, some of the best serve you get if you wait out there for like, you know, three, four hours. Others leave, the, others leave go back to the beach, drive home. Uh, but if you wait long enough, sometimes that wave, that wave, the, the perfect waves, the couple of them, the 10, 12 minutes um, build up and, and you have an amazing surf. And, 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 and I think that's kind of how we felt now, how we feel now in that space. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we feel that, that we're the best in that space, but there is something cool about the fact that if I look back what I talked about four years ago, it's the same crap that I talk about today, right? So, uh, but but it, it kind of happened. That's to, that to me is interesting. Um, up until a year and a half ago, you all had not raised more than, ten, in more than single digit millions of dollars. Um, and I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what your experience was with investors. You, you have some of the best angel investors in the Valley. Um, but when you got to your, you know, first year series A round, talk to us like, was it, did people get it? Um, this is just a couple of years ago, but did people understand where this was going? It, had they figured it out? Um, you know, what, what was that experience like? Yeah, so I, th I think I have a good read on that now because I actually thought about this a lot. I, I thought about, so just for some background, we had a great time raising a seed round and, and you're right, we had some really smart investors in the seed round. And then we had a really tough time raising our Series A. Um, and ultimately, Founders Fund let the Series A, and Brian Singerman at Founders Fund did, and it, it, everything was great. But I think what happened is the following. Um, we knew that the space would work out to be something really exciting. And for angel investors, that's probably all that they care about. They care about a group of really smart people um, really passionate about a topic, and is, is that person then telling a convincing story why the company that they start to build can be one of the forerunners if that space is going to happen? Now, that's probably all you need to raise your seed round and to raise maybe, you know, whatever you call it, an angel round. But when we came to the first institutional investors, a lot of what we were talking about hadn't happened yet. So in, in, in end of 2012, when we raised our Series A, we, we didn't have any Starbucks, Walgreens, 7-Eleven, Chipotle strategic partnership. We didn't have millions of deliveries. We didn't have tens of thousands of couriers or hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, in sales on the platform. It was still us just talking about it. And, and that was a lot for them to believe that a, the space would develop, and B, that we would be one of the companies that, in whatever sense that term makes any sense, would lead that space. So you have the same guys running around, the product looks great, but the, the, the volume is very low, there's no partnerships. Now we know it's just because the space and, and, and the world just probably needed another year or two until you know, more and more companies enter that market to, to really push the market. But I think that's what happened. So sometimes you can almost be a little bit too early. And, and, and I believe that's what happened uh, to us in the Series A. There were no competitive, uh, uh, almost no competitors, very few data points to look at. So, you know, you, you got to believe in these guys hard. If you if you raise uh, if you lead the Series A because it, it, if it's institutional money it means a lot. It, it, it's just different things that, that 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 someone like an institutional investor looks at than your angel or seed investor. And what what ultimately pushed it over for you? You 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 met with all the top investors in the yeah. valley. Basically, most of them said no. And, well, they never and say no. They say uh, you know let's keep talking. Nobody <laughs> says no. That's right. the old rule, right? Right. That, that's what's the most frustrating part is because nobody ever says no. They just say like, eh, that's cool, but... Keep me updated. Yeah. Why don't we keep talking? Keep sending me those yeah. updates. Yeah. Yeah. They don't want to say no. And so what finally pushed it over the edge, the edge for you? What, what, do you th what do you think it was with the Founders Fund? Um, you know, what, 
what changed with them? Was it something with them? Was it something in the way you pitched it? Was it the way that you, you thought about it or pitched it differently? Or what, what had the big impact there? I think one other VC firm put out a term sheet that wasn't very favorable for us. And um, we told Founders Fund that we have that term sheet. And then they put out one that was clearly better. Um, and that's how that deal came about. So uh, I, I, I can't tell you what it really was. At the end of the day, I, I, I think it's, it's Brian Singerman convincing uh, Peter Thiel and Luke and um, everybody else, Kenny at, at Founders Fund, that this is a great deal. Um, I love that 80% of your traffic is word of mouth. Um, you haven't spent any money on marketing. We do um, a little bit. You we do, do now? Yeah. Okay. We do a little bit. Um, so, First of all, how do you measure that? How do you how do you measure? Is it you know how do you measure the eighty percent? And then what do you what do you attribute that to? What part of the experience is so great that people want to talk about and share with their friends? Yeah. Well, the, I mean, the, the you, you can't really measure word of mouth up to the to the digit. But if you spend money and you know, let's just say, what installs you get back and you get, you know, eighty percent more, then you have a clear understanding on kind of what you're spending for and and, and what is organic or word of mouth. I think the reverse is actually easier than, than trying to figure out if this is all word of mouth and then you get into problems. What if word of mouth, a lot of it has probably been press and people inviting other friends. So there's elements that you can track and then there's a little bit of unknown, right? It's yeah. like this, this, this area. Sometimes stuff just happens. Um, and the, the other question was how we attribute it to what? Yeah, like what part of the experience, like what makes it so great? What, you know, what is, what is the point where the user says, this is something that I want to tell my friends about? This, th what part of it is, is, is so different and interesting for people? I mean, at, at the very beginning, it was just something that you couldn't get anywhere else. So I think we were lucky enough that at the time that we launched, even though it was maybe a little bit early, you had an, an early adopter circle of people that are just use it and they're like, what just happened? Because it is hard to understand that, but there was no substitute. Like, the only substitute was for you to do it yourself. I any of that. Um, and, and I get it. Now there's like eight or nine companies, and uh, everybody gets a million dollars, and, and, and that's cool. But th there was nothing there. So yeah. I think that use case in itself, that you can point your mobile phone at a store, and you see a menu in the best case, or often you didn't, and you type it in, and uh, average delivery time in San Francisco is 28 minutes later, you get something that's that's pretty cool yeah so just being first there was a huge first there's a f first mover advantage for you guys just being the first option get getting a physical product delivered in a couple of minutes yes yeah what is the what does the future of this market look like what, where where are things going where do you th where, what do you think about when you think about where things are going to be in five or ten years I mean it's impossible to completely predict but like what what do you think about and what do you think is going to happen to this market I obviously think it's going to grow. I, 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 I don't think I, I know it myself, um, which is probably alarming uh, somewhat. <laughs> um, but what I mean by that is I, I, on-demand services could, could go one of two ways. They, I think we could see a future where um, there is one or two destination apps or websites where you go to and you get things like an Amazon is today in the world of commerce, or it could be a more distributed version. Um, so that, 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 could, that could lend itself more towards a platform play, as in a PayPal um, or an infrastructure for deliveries, period. But wh where, which of the two or if the two could live with each other, uh, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure about it yet. Tell us, just give us some of the stats about Postmates. What, tell us about the growth. Tell us about where things are at today. And, and uh, you know, t tell us, brag a little bit for us. Does, does anybody, nobody really wants to? Or well, like I want to know. And I, I have the mic, so. You so, <laughs> we, we um, by December, we will do a million deliveries a month. Um, wow. On, on the platform. And um, this year, the company will grow 8.5x. Eight, 8 um, so it gives you an indicator where we were at the beginning of the year. Um, and now we're over halfway there to the goal. Um, 
which we better be because it's almost October. <laughs> um, and unless we want to grow 150% in December, um, uh, we're making headway. Um, I think another number um, that, 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 we, um, um, that we used before is that we have, I think it's just under 14,000 Postmates doing deliveries um, in, in 30 cities. Um, and um, we're launching a whole bunch of cities more soon. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it, you know, we're, we're happy where it's at. We, it, th there's one thing that I'm actually the most proud of, and that is that we have made money from day one. So mm -hmm. uh, that sounds totally insane. We had almost from the entire start a positive uh, gross profit margin. And, and we usually like our gross profit margin anywhere between 15 and 20%. Um, at any given month. Sometimes there is some seasonality in there. So, um, if you complain why Postmates is sometimes expensive, then the answer is because we like to make money. Um, but <laughs> it, 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 jokes aside, it, it, it has been, uh, I believe it was important for us as a company to figure out a business model, especially in a space where it's just us telling people that this is going to be an interesting space at some point. Well, and what was the, I mean, what's been the reaction over the last few years in the Valley? I mean, we, we've, I think that the mindset of being a revenue first or revenue uh, thoughtfully, you know, driving revenue companies uh, has changed where now it's like, you know, every YC company you see now is making some money or has a, a very clear business model that they're talking about. But I mean, that, that was another big differentiator. You think about three or four years ago, like who was talking about making money you know, in, in these scalable startups. It just wasn't something that people were referring to. And here you are thinking about it from day one. And, and you know, and, and now we're seeing, uh, I can't remember what the term is that they're now using for the, the failed unicorns, um, the, 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 the unicorns that are dying. But you see these companies that, are, that have mismanaged marketing, spend, you know, they've mismanaged their funds and they've just been growing because of the marketing. Um, and it just seems like a huge competitive advantage for you guys. I mean, I, all I can say is that I've, I've pitched partners at VC firms that had no idea how even to get to gross profit um, when, when they look at the financials of a company. So there, 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 there's probably truth in, in, in what you said. Um, I think the more mature a company it is, the more important it is to, to, to have that figured out. Um, I think if you can't show uh, unit economics, um, if you're in the business of selling stuff or if you're in the business of, of, of actually making money, then... We're, our unit economics look a lot like Uber's, but with added GMV. So we're, we 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 like that. What what does the future of Postmates look like? What is you know you're sitting here in five years from now. What is what is what is Postmates? Wh where do you see it going? Well, I think the, we always had this dream that it could be that it could become like it. it that sounds incredibly boring, but um, that it could be like a utility, just just something that's there. Um, uh, so. If you purchase products, there's a button for that. Um, you know, something that's reliable, that, that, that is part of a city, that's part of a community, that it's part of interactions, that is part of commerce. Um, so, you know, it, it is not so much swinging for the fences, but more like be, be becoming like an infrastructure that a lot of people can use. Let's give uh, Bastian a big round of applause. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs>